All right, and we're live. Uh, so I'm here with Kaz Mastoey. Uh, he's the former head of hardware for Boss and Nova Robotics, an all-around great guy, and um, just just a like-minded person. I'm excited to have you on and kind of just talk more about uh, sort of some of the process and, and what we work on here. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for uh, putting this together. Thanks for coming. So I got this uh, Basil Hayden uh, whiskey from Kentucky. That's pretty good. I've been drinking this on a lot of the apps we've recorded so far. Uh, and then it sounds like That's, you've got, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you got? I I just have a bottle of Glenlivet 12 year. I usually um, usually try to stock Johnny Walker Blue, but uh, nice. I ran out and I haven't ordered any in a while. Yeah, it's not cheap from what I've heard. I haven't tried it yet, though. I would like to. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard good yeah, things about it. It's like 230 bucks. Here in Pennsylvania, um, for the 750 really, milliliter. Uh, yeah, for a liter. Oh wow! All right, that's that's not nothing. Um, I I guess it's a liter, right? I think by default a fifth is 750 milliliters, so that's what like this Boyd and Blair bottle would be. Okay. But then you can you can get a liter too. This might actually. Yeah, be it's it's probably 750 milliliters. So um, yeah, it's like I think 230 here in Pittsburgh or anywhere in Pennsylvania, but um, I'm not confirming this is true, but just hypothetically, um, there are ways of having relatives in California <laughs> that, can, that uh, could pick it up for you theoretically for 150 bucks. And wow. Should, yeah. That's amazing. That's so much less. I still have bottles of whiskey, by the way, that I bought like in 2013 when I was intern at SpaceX and brought with me. When I drove, got like, because I just bought so much because the price is there, and, and just you know, I don't know, I haven't run out yet. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I there was a time where I had a little bit of a problem with Johnny Walker Blue, um, and uh, I was working at this one place, and they used to bribe me or, or motivate <laughs> me with, with bottles of bottles of blue. That's a pretty motivating uh, bottle to give. Um, yeah. I mentioned Kristen from Deep Local. One of the ways we became friends is I believe I gave her a bottle of either Glen Morgani or um, might have been Lafrogue, but it was some single malt. And I was just an intern at the time, and I think it surprised her, and it kind of piqued her curiosity. And, and that's sort of what opened the door. And then we just started hanging out and drinking together. And you know, it was like years later we kind of reconnected and became friends that way. So Kristen Petty for our listeners, uh, it's Kristen Stanton now, she, she married into, but everybody around Deep Local, this local agency that makes just dynamic sculptures. We're going to have a few people from there on probably. Um, she has, uh, I don't know, just, uh, she was my boss at that company, like directly. She, she hired pretty much everyone that was there when I was an intern back in the day. And so, uh, yeah, interesting person. Uh, definitely a yeah. cool human to be around. Yeah, Deep Local's doing some really amazing things. Um, I I haven't talked to Nathan for a while, but um, every once in a while I stop in, and did, it's it's always something super cool going on. Did you and him work together in some capacity, like in, in a previous job somewhere? I feel like I remember you saying it, something about that. Yeah, so I worked at um, my design. It was my first nice. job out of school, and. Um, so Nathan and I weren't there. We our our time there didn't overlap a lot, um, but he was one of the guys there. I got to know him a little bit. Um, I got to know him more actually after. But uh, yeah, super cool guy. I like him a lot. Yeah, I like him too. I, I think he's got the coolest gig going in Pittsburgh, really. Honestly, like of all the places I've worked aside from SKA, like Deep Local was my favorite. I, I, I quite enjoyed it there. Yeah. My design, um, I, I worked there for six years. It was my first job. They were they were doing some really, really amazing stuff early on. Um, we had a staff philosopher. Um, Would that have been Andy Norman, I think? Yes. Nice. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> I do. Okay. Yeah. He's actually my uh, therapist now. I probably shouldn't have said his last name. Now I got to censor that. <laughs> but, uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I just started seeing him like literally like a month ago, and he's been name dropping all these people, and I'm like, all right, this is probably the guy for me. <laughs> oh man, that's cool. Um, yeah. yeah, I I love Andy Norman. Um, yeah, he's a cool dude. I like him a lot too. I'll tell him you said that if it's cool. I mean, I think he'd appreciate. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell him hello. Um, yeah. That, so, um, yeah, the early days of Maya when I was there, um, I I discovered Maya at like two o'clock in the morning one day. <laughs> And <laughs> it's amazing. So I'm reading their website and I was like, this is so fucking amazing. Um, yeah. So I stayed up that whole night. I read everything. I read about every employee. That's awesome. I, said, I just have to, I just have to work at this company somehow. Wait, so they put all of their employees like out there, like just on their well, website at the yeah, time? Yeah. Every, every, the bio of every person was on their website. I looked at every product every that's, project they that's had ballsy done. i mean to, to put it blindly I, I read the whole website i printed the whole website i knew everything that there was to know about mine <laughs> that's um, I'm, I'm sure you like were pretty well advantaged for that interview as a result of having researched it so heavily and had the enthusiasm i well i think ultimately that's kind of what got me in the door um so eventually they had a position open for an industrial designer. And at that time in my career, I really didn't even know what an industrial designer was. <laughs> Been there. Yeah. So I applied for the job through email. I sent, um, Terry Pronto was the HR person back then. Interesting. I sent her a copy of my resume and like a really enthusiastic cover letter. That's um, awesome that I probably spent like three days writing or something. I know the feeling. <laughs> and so, um, I got a call back and they said, well, yeah, you know, um, they'd like to just have a phone interview with you. So it was Rich Trebone. Um, and he called me up and we talked about some stuff and he's like, we don't really have a position exactly right now, but you know, we like to bring you in. You know, we just hire opportunistically, and um, you know, it's a good way to hire. Yeah. So, anyway, I went in, um, and like the whole interview process was really grueling. They they basically invite any everyone and anyone to the interview. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And so anyway, the interview went pretty well, but it was rough. Um, they, they really take pleasure in, you know, ruffling your feathers and oh, make you sweat. that's right. I used to do that. I had a tutoring company, uh, back in the day and this was a horrible interview question. I think we have the same glasses. That's awesome. But I would, um, I would start by asking, this was such a jerk interview question. I would ask, but what makes you think you're good enough to work for me? And the reason I said that is because I wanted to see how they reacted to a hostile client, like from the onset. These days, yeah. I'm not really that cruel in interviews anymore. <laughs> I've kind of grown out of it. But at the time, I thought that's what you were supposed to do. And um, I mean, it, you know, it worked. I got some people that were really sharp under pressure. But uh, yeah. I don't know if I have the heart to act like that anymore. Yeah, so they weren't they weren't really giving me like, you know, the Google singers of, you know, like if you're standing in front of a mirror and your image is reversed left to right, why is it not reversed up and down? You know, it wasn't that kind of crap. It was, you know, it's, it's, you know, tell me a product that really speaks to you and tell me why it speaks to you. And then then really press hard and, you know, try to, shake your your ground and see see where you stand so even if your premise was good they would try to fracture it just to see how you reacted to the pressure yeah that's pretty cool yeah. actually that sounds like a like a viable tactic like it's not always fun to have those confrontations but it's better to find out in an interview than once you've hired somebody i feel like that, uh, that they're not gonna be able to withstand yeah. that kind of pressure yeah so um so i interviewed and then they said, well, we really don't have anything right now, but we, we kind of like you and um, we think we think we'll like to have you sometime. So it's like, okay. Um, so a year goes by and um, Rich calls me up and he said, hey Kaz, how about we meet for lunch? 
we go to lunch and he's like, you know, hey, are you still interested? He said, you know, full disclaimer, Maya's a really kooky place. <laughs> Nobody gets rich. We're not going to be giving you a big salary. No one gets a good salary. But, um, you know, you seem like somebody that's really passionate. So, um, it's good yeah. that he put it all out there, right? I'm just like, this is what it is. What do you want to do? And so many people around Pittsburgh that I respect have made their bones at my, uh, I mean, that's just, I mean, we'd list it off like four of them at the beginning of the call, you know, like. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was great. It was, an, it was like a fantastic education. It was also very humbling. Like every day I was there, I, I just felt like I was the dumbest person in the place. I know the feeling. Uh, that's how I felt at Deep Local. That's how I felt at SpaceX. That's how I feel in my current job at times. But you want to yeah. feel that way because that means you're working around really super intelligent people. And the ch chances are you're not the dumbest person there. You just think you are because you're smart enough to realize your own shortcomings. So. Yeah. You know, I've maintained friendship with a lot of those people. And, um, and you know, a lot of them, with, with a few exceptions, you know, a lot of them sort of said the same thing, you know. It's, it's one of those things working there. You just always feel like the dumbest person. <laughs> well, I think that means you're just making the right hires. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was really great. Um, eventually, um, one of the founders uh, sold off the sister company um, to General Dynamics. Interesting. And made a ton of money. And he but got... That have been Jay Katarinzik by chance, or am I? No, this was Pete Lucas. Okay, I don't know Pete. Uh, yet. So, um, he, as time went on, he he became more hands off and was doing his own thing. He moved out to, um, I think San Jose, and and then brought in some other people to just manage the day to day stuff. General and, Dynamics uh, makes tanks, right? Just to. So I'm not following two days. What's that? So General Dynamics makes like the M1 Abrams battle tank, right? Well, uh, they do a lot of things. They're, you know, probably the largest uh, U.S. government contractor. Wow. Um, so. Um, it's an impressive stat. Yeah. Yeah. So we had some new management. Uh, lots, lots of things changed. Um, a lot of. A handful of the really, really great people left. There was, I mean, everybody there was great. So, you know, they still had a lot of talent. Um, and then I eventually left and, um, and that was that. Fair enough. What made you decide to leave? And I guess, where did you go from there? Like what was, <laughs> so I actually got fired. Um, Fair enough. well, it, it wasn't really fired. Um, under under the old management, um, you know, we really didn't pay a lot of attention to the money that we had. Um, we didn't really go on sales calls. We waited for people to call us, and then we would actually decide if our customers were worthy. And it was like a whole company decision. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they had sort of like criteria uh, that would be like, you know, is this project, you know, world changing? Is interesting. Is this is this breaking new ground? Um, is this good for us? Is is it interesting to us? And you know, a lot of a lot that of that sounds things, like Andy was probably involved in those decisions a lot, just based on how he thinks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, under the new management. You know, we lost a lot of talent. Uh, the customers that we wanted, we weren't landing anymore. Um, and, you know, there were a bunch of cuts. It's unfortunate. Um, yeah, I ended up taking, like, <laughs> I ended up going to HR and saying, look, you know, I don't, I know we're out of money. I don't want us to lose any talent. So I'm going to volunteer to work here with no salary for 
a while. And that probably turned out to be like nine months of just working without salary. So I still went to work every day. Everything was just normal. I just didn't get paid. Yeah, um, that's good of you. I mean, and I mean, it definitely speaks to a passion about the gig and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. the process for sure. Yeah. Um, and then um, there were, well, I don't want to get into some of the personnel issues, yeah, but no worries. Um, there, there was one, there was one person that had like left the company because he was worried that he was going to get laid off. So he wanted to preemptively first. Yeah, that makes sense. And then while he was there or while he was gone, I kind of ended up um, doing a lot of his work, which was ah. uh, mechanical work, IV work. Um, and then he eventually came back um, and, you know, there was a lot of tension and so he felt like you were stepping on his turf a little bit, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah. Okay, that makes um, sense. And then he became my boss. Ah. <laughs> so I was at, I was at lunch with Terry, who was you know our HR person. Uh, you know, we just went to lunch sometimes. So nice. I said, you know, he, I know he's gonna fire me. He is definitely gonna fire me. Um, you know, all of a sudden we're like no longer friends. I don't understand. Um, and then like two weeks later, they said, Hey, you know, um, you know, we're doing some cost cutting measures. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the, I hate to say it, but I've used that cop out before, uh, when I didn't want to burn a bridge with somebody, but I had to get rid of them. Yeah. But, um, you know, mine had really changed a lot by that point. Um, Andy was already gone. Um, it was, I'd say it. Losing Andy was uh, really like one of the worst days of my life at, when I was working at Maya. Wow. Um, yeah, we. I definitely got to let him know you said that because I, I think it'll really warm his cockles. Not to sound too yeah. cockney or British there, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, we lost a couple other people. Um, Skip Shelley, very amazing person. You may know him. Mark yeah. Water. The name they sounds both, familiar with those guys, but I don't think I know them. Obviously. Yeah, they opened their own firm. Um, those two, I, I used to beg to go to some of their meetings sometimes just to watch them. Um, you know, <laughs> That's awesome. My, my presentations were awesome. And these two in the room, you know, I wouldn't be actually watching them. I would watch the customers. Interesting. Uh, or potential customers. And they they were, you know, Skip Shelley could have told them to like walk over a cliff and, and these guys would have done it. <laughs> That's amazing. You, know, you say you didn't they, do sales, they, but it sounds like you were masters of it. They, well, I mean, mine had a really compelling story and that was part of it. But Skip and Mark, they, they, they're, just in, they were incredible speakers and they were incredible at articulating the Maya story. And That's awesome. These customers would just, uh, I mean, they, they were helpless. They were just helpless. <laughs> I mean, I hate to tell you it, but that's called sales. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's exactly what that is. It, it is, but I've, I've never seen magic like that before. Never. Yeah. Um, it's high art. I think, I think sales gets a bad rap from like, I was looking at investment properties the other day. We kind of talked about this before we started recording, but um, I was working with this one sales uh, sales uh, you know uh, real estate agent uh, with a certain company I'm not going to mention, and she was just like dead weight. Like she was she was claiming to be an expert in things she didn't know about. So I was looking for properties for rental, and I could tell. So she, first of all, she asked my price range and I told her and I said, it's, it's, you know, X to Y. And she said, all right, you know, X to Y, uh, how about properties that cost Y and a little bit over Y? She just went right to the ceiling of my range and, and then yeah. just showed me stuff that was there and none of it was economically viable for a rental property. And so, you know, I, I think I said something along the lines of like, you know, do you, what's the market like in this area? Who's, who are the prospective clients? Like are it students, professionals, section eight, like, what are we looking at here? And she had no idea. You know, she couldn't answer any of those questions. 
but she was very high pressure. Like she was trying to get me to sign an exclusivity agreement right out of the gate that I would only work with her, but she brought very little to the table. And I think people like that are, are why people think salespeople are all kind of squirrely, you know, jerks that, you know, are going to bend you over a table. Yeah. Um, and it's really unfortunate. I mean, you know, there's the adages about like used car dealers, you know, that'll just lie about and like wind back the odometer. And I don't think that's, that's what sales has to be. I think, I think that that story that you're talking about, I mean, actually yeah. being an advocate for your customer, you know, being on the same side of the table as them, like literally and figuratively where, where you're like, okay, how can we actually help you? And if we can't, let's not do this because it's not a good fit. You know, yeah. and I think that's that's the key to ethical sales, and that's that's what I try to do. You know, I mean, in my many hats I wear as you know a small business owner, but when I'm selling, I try to I try to be honest and, and just upfront, and only go after jobs where we can create value. And so I don't know, yeah, yeah. a little bit yeah. hokey, but that's what it is. These, these guys weren't even in our sales. They they were sort of. Um, I mean, they were just practitioners. They were just my practitioners. Yeah. That, well, I mean, so am I. You know what I do. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I'm a program manager slash engineer. I mean, I, I'm not a salesman by training at all, but you know, it's just it's just part of the job, and you know, I'm gonna call it what it is. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. So as far as I know, they have their own firm now. Um, Do you know what it is? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, it's called Water Shelley. Interesting. I gotta check them out. They they sound like brilliant, interesting people. That would at least be fun to yeah. buy lunch yeah, for and, and talk really to awesome sometime. Guys. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so Maya's culture started to unwind. You know, the founder was out in um, San Jose. We had new management, um, and it was, you know, a really big personality that was kind of like crowding out the uh, other personalities. And people oftentimes feel like they have to do that. Like they want to put their mark on it. It's like mark in a territory or something. Yeah, I mean, it's okay to do that, but it was like the, it, it was becoming the only mark. That's and, unfortunate. Um, well, I think it's yeah. when people tweak things just to tweak things. Like if they don't have a reason for it, if they don't, if it doesn't add value and make it better, but you just want to shape it and, and leave some kind of a stamp, I think that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah. And, you know, the, the new management was really talented, but... Um, at the end of the day, it was, you know, Maya was, you know, the Maya um, employees, it was sort of like a one plus one equals a hundred. <laughs> uh, you know, you start adding up the employees, they, they just, they fed off of each other. And, um, and then, you know, when this new management came in, you know, all those, all those voices really got trampled on and silenced. And, and, you know, it doesn't matter how talented you are as one person, um, you know, in that Maya culture, it, you know, it was, it just diminished the company. That's unfortunate. And I feel like, especially if you're recruiting on the basis of like, you're not going to get rich here, but you're going to have a good time and we're going to influence things in a positive way that that isn't sustainable if you take away the fun or the fulfillment of the experience unfortunately and so i i see where you're coming from there you kind of broke the yeah. model is what it sounds yeah. like yeah cool so, so uh, i guess can i ask where your journey took you after that uh yeah so after that um i um i spent some time at some other startups I went to um, the University of Pittsburgh startup. They were making a robotic wheelchair. Oh, cool! Is that the one with the two uh, Nico arms on it? No, this is the Pearl was, Lab, this, unfortunately named, in my opinion. No, no, <laughs> this one, this one was mostly meant for people that had multiple disabilities. So, oh, they, cool. Um, you know, you can think of somebody that um, needs a wheelchair, but what happens if they get Parkinson's disease? They're going to be like crashing into things. Um, you know, Parkinson's where you have the, the tremors. Yeah, I'm aware. Okay. But it's All probably right, good so, to clarify for our viewers. So I'm not, not yeah. complaining. <laughs> yeah. just, just making sure. I wanted to say industrial design when you said ID to clarify, but I also didn't want to cut you off because you were on such an awesome role and I was just enjoying listening. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, um, there's a couple of researchers from Pitt 
and they had this idea of a robotic wheelchair that would make it safe for uh, people with multiple disabilities to drive a powered wheelchair. Interesting. There's a bunch of ways to do that. I can, I'm already, this is the engineer in me. I'm starting to like brainstorm the problem in my head. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, we made this, um, you know, this distributed computing, distributed sensing network. Interesting. Um, it's not what I would have gone to. Yeah. That's cool. So we had this, we had this, this set of modules that were sensors distributed around the chair and it would look for obstacles. It would look for, you know, descending staircases. Nice. Do you use like sonar lasers? Like what were you, what were you using as your sensors? So this, lasers were still crazy expensive. So we were using, a, um, like com- complementary pairs of, uh, sonar sensors and IR sensors. Not a single, single dimension IR, like the old school sharp sensors. Yeah. It was like oh, old yeah. school sharp. It's awesome. We weren't, we weren't actually using the, um, the old, um, Polaroid sonars. We were using yeah, I remember those things <laughs> <laughs> pulled right out of the cameras. Yeah. yeah. We, we were, uh, Max Botics was just coming online back then. I don't remember Max Botics. I, I'm, um, I mean, I, you have to remember, like, I was still, like, technically a kid in the 90s, so I was, like, I was, like, maybe 12 years old when it rolled over to, like, 2000. Oh, yeah. And, but I, I was I was big into it as a hobbyist, and so that's how I knew about this stuff, like the Polaroid sensors. Yeah. So these these Max Botic sensors, they're still widely used, and um, I think they, they've cornered a pretty big market share these days. That's awesome. Um, so we were using those, and... And we had this module that um, you you put it in between the the wheelchair's joystick and its motor controller. So normally the joystick can, connects directly to the motor controller. Yep, I, I've worked with those um, modules on a couple of projects just you know early on in my career. Yeah, exactly. So um, I built this module, um, and it went in between those two guys. And it interpreted what the driver wanted to do. Yeah. And then based on the, the sensors, which were all connected by CAN, um, if it was a dangerous direction for the driver, it wouldn't let them go in that direction. Interesting. So it just straight up found it. It didn't let them override. Right. So, you know, if you're going, if you're, you know, going down a long hallway. By the way, not to interrupt, but just as yeah. I say, is there any way we can uh, turn on the music on your end? It's just a little distracting. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that you could even hear it. Usually my computer filters it out. All good. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, music puts me at ease and I love it. So I didn't want to say anything, but I just, my brain was working on it. I was like, ah, I probably should say something. Yeah, my my yeah, phone I mean, rang. So I feel like a jerk. Like it, you know, I had to silence the sucker. So no, no worries. Yeah. Yeah. This, this computer has beam for me. Um, so like you can never hear the music ever. And what well, you mean? Like it can send directionally like the music. If, it, it has two mics and it uses beamforming. If I'm not directly in front of the mic on my laptop, yeah, you can't hear anything. I mean, it's that's like, kind of incredible. And it you can do that with just two instead of this is the Google question you were talking about. Like, I don't know. It it has it has amazing uh, attenuation to things that are out of out of plane. That's really okay. So it, it's just it's just yeah. meant to get stuff that's only on that one plane and nothing else. So right. if you were like up here, it would get you. But if you're over here, you're not going to hear you. Yeah. And my, my speakers are like, you know, six, seven feet to either side. That's awesome. I got an Onkyo receiver under the table and I got one there and one there. So I am big, big fan of audio. I, I got, yeah, a, I got a 16 channel DAC on this thing too. It, it's a sweet rig. So I got, let me tell you what I'm wearing just cause we're nerding out over this and I haven't mentioned it at all on the podcast yet. I've done like yeah. eight episodes at this point recorded, but not edited yet. And so, uh, basically it's, it's an HP, uh, dual processor. So two, six core Xeon server grade workstation. It, it's like a, it's like a nineties Corvette. It's, it's like very old. So it was made in 2013, but it's just maxed. So it's got 24 gigs of Ram. It's got uh, six, sorry, no, four SSDs as the boot drive that are in a RAID 5. So if one fails, the other ones can still pull the weight and, and it'll, it'll, it won't even go down for a second. And then um, I got um, two uh, P620 uh, Quadro graphics cards. So it's an NVIDIA graphics card. Only draws 40 watts of power and then each one's got four monitor outs. So 
running the one behind me and then two there and there. It's a sweet rig. I'm sorry to nerd out no, no, over no, that. I just I, I get so happy about that kind of stuff. It's like computer port. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then, yeah, the 16-channel DAC is sweet. So there's there's a quarter rack in front of me that's got the DAC, it's got a headphone amplifier, and then it's got a power conditioner, and then the Accio receiver is up top. So it's, it's a fun little Yeah, sound. I want to know what DAC you're, you're using. Oh, it's an old one. So it's, it's a little embarrassing. It's, it's an Echo. Um, and so it's it's from back when it was Firewire. So it looks like it's an Audio Fire 12. Okay. So it's, it's a little outdated, but... I mean, you know, it's trying to trying to get set up on the cheap, hence the camera failure earlier. But yeah, we're we're I, actually upgrading a day, so in a day we're ordering the parts in a day. We're probably gonna upgrade in a week. But the plan is to get um, what is it? Uh, SDI cameras, so like the same standard they use for like news recording and, and professional video. Um, yeah. Just because I, I had an engineer in here yesterday who just knows more about you know videography and, and audio than I do, and. Um, we're having all sorts of USB issues. So there's three webcams right now. There's one there, one there, and one there. They're all Logitech's, you know, like best webcams on the market. But there's still USB, which is a major problem. And we've talked about this, you know. Yeah. I hate USB <laughs> for anything that matters. It started with USB. It's such a unfortunately uh, unreliable interface. I, I'm not a fan. Yeah. I am a fan in the sense that it can run anything. I'm not a fan in the sense that I wouldn't want it on a critical system. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great for interoperability, um, but, you know, if you have more than a few devices and any length of cable... <laughs> I think 20 you're, feet you exceed and you're boned. I mean, it's maybe 30. Yeah. 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 And so we're pushing the limits. I mean, we've got two identical webcams. Like, you know, this computer's according to the drivers, it's got, like, like a silly amount of USB root hubs on it, like a, like some like eight to twelve. I don't remember counting them, but it, more than you would expect because it's a server grade workstation. It's got you know it's it's got server hardware in it, but um, you know they're all USB two hubs because it's old. And so um, we ran one USB three card. Well, we had we were in here the other day, and um, we sort of like was like that's probably the culprit. So we got a pricey one to replace it. So the first one it was a Vantech that we purchased for 30 bucks because Vantech's reputable. I mean, they make motor drives that I like, um, you know, they're, they're, I like Vantech. And so I figured they put their name on something good, which they probably did to be fair, uh, but this is legacy hardware. So um, I think what it was is we, we got it, we got one for 140 bucks, which is like throw money at it, see if that fixes it, you know, and like, you know, four times the cost of the old card, you know, who cares, we just want it to work. And so we got that same exact chipset as the Vantech card. And so it was the same driver. Um, and then it's one of those confounding things where uh, it wasn't me. It was, it was the, um, the engineer we're using whose name I'm not going to say. But, you know, he's good. It's just a weird, confounding thing. And um, basically, when he rolled the driver forward, he couldn't roll it back and recover the old setup. And so he just knocked out our USB 3. And um, I think SDI is a better move. I mean, I'm, I'm you know. I'm not one to complain about stuff like that. I'm just kind of happy to, to be moving past it. And I'm one to learn from it, right? So it's just like, all right, don't yeah. use USB on something that matters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry if that was too much of a rabbit hole. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Um, we went from like uh, awesome design firm stuff to like computer nerd. <laughs> like, uh, that's fine. High school stuff. <laughs> yeah. Do? Yeah, I have I have an old DAC too. It's called, nice. Music streamer too. It's really outdated. That's a, a, um, what. What's what's he got? What's the story? Where is it? What what? When's it from? Was it do? What's the interface? I don't know. I um. I don't know. I probably bought it like. So when I was at Bossa Nova, um, <laughs> I I moved in with my stereo, of course. <laughs> Wait, into your office? Well, no, we had we had open space. We had open seating. Um, oh, cool. But, uh, you know, traditional cast style. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to move into places. That's awesome. Uh, so, you know, I moved in with speakers. I had uh, like a Harman Kardon amp. <sighs> they make great stuff. I, I was just helping a guy out with one of those in Austin, Texas last week. Uh, they're sweet amps. I love them. Yeah. They're, they're, not as, they're not as awesome as they used to be, but... Uh, 
they're still they're still pretty clean and decent for the well, for the price. I'm one of those guys that likes 80 ta 80s tech a lot. So if I can find a good JBL, a good Harman Kardon, you know, uh, Denon yeah, sure. makes good stuff. Macintosh, if you can afford even the old stuff. I mean, yeah, I've seen I people hear. pay thirty grand for a pair of speakers from the eighties from then. I mean, it's yeah. uh, they're they're up there. <laughs> it's it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, I I bought some speakers a couple years ago. Speaking of speakers, we'll we'll divert for a second. Yeah, sure. That that I think are like the best bargain speakers you could buy. By the way, you're the first audiophile I've had on. This is awesome. I'm really liking this. Yeah. Um, these speakers are called, uh, they're made by a company called Tectons, pretty small. Nice. Um, You've showed me these, but I still want to hear about it because the story's interesting. Oh yeah, so I told you about these already? You did, but let's let's talk about it anyway. Like, okay, so people need to hear it. Right. They're, they're, <laughs> called, they're, they're called Tecton Double Impacts. Um, I think the founder is a little bit crazy and he <laughs> you know, some of the technology I mean, you know how audio guys are. Right? Yeah, it's a lot of it's like snake oil. Like, you know, this was rubbed with yeah, virgins, like, think, feces from 1980 that we saved until 2000. Then we opened it up at a certain date. You know, it's like, no, you didn't. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, the guys that pay like $10,000 for like the AC power cord and say that they can hear the difference <laughs> in their music, you know, it's like these types of things. And so, but anyway, the, the guy that runs this company, um, you know, he doesn't publish all the specs and he That's talks about a lot of things that are, you know, obvious bullshit. Um, I brought that company up to a colleague, by the way, that I bought the stereo off of and he's like, I hate that company. But I thought it was funny because it's good that you admit, yeah. I bet you that's where he's drawing that conclusion from it is exactly what Probably, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, but the speakers, they sound, they sound awesome and they are like full range. They're highly efficient. Um, very crisp. The only downside is they're pretty directional. Yeah. Um, not quite as bad as, uh, you know, like electrostatic speakers, but um, I haven't, still awesome. I haven't messed with electrostatic speakers yet. Like, can Do you mind if I ask what that is or like how that works? I'm just curious. So that's basically a speaker where um, like the whole front is like this. I don't know if it's like mylar or it's some Interesting. kind of... Uh, it's just like a big sheet, um, and it vibrates, and they sound really, really awesome. But if you are like two degrees out of the sweet, <laughs> <they're horrible. laughs> and, and they're also like incredibly power hungry. Ah, it's rough. So, um, so it sounds like a novelty for the most part, unless you're trying to like send sound super directionally to one place. Yeah, I mean, you know, if if you have a chair in your living room and that's where you listen to music and you want, you know, the best possible sound that you could get without having headphones on your head, <laughs> uh, you know, that's what you get. Um, yeah. Got got my uh, my cheat box over here, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing really beats headphones, but, you yeah. know, who wants to wear them? Well, exactly. And, I mean, it, it is uncomfortable. And, I mean, I've been wearing them for a few of these episodes, but I find once I get the mic level right, like, you don't really need them. And, I mean, you can, I yeah. don't know, you can, you can get great sound. And, like you said, I mean, nobody wants to wear those all the time. And, yeah. I don't know. I knew one guy when I was, I was a research programmer really early in my career. Uh, I was working for Case Western Reserve University. I used to joke I was the only freshman with an office. I had this one professor, and I remember I um, I must have really impressed him. It was a it was a class called Data Structures and Algorithms Analysis, and and the guy was fascinating. It was a Russian immigrant named Misha, and um, he had worked for um, I think Bell Labs, um, where I believe like Faraday, the guy that invented the the transistor, also worked for like Bell. Labs. Like it, it's an crazy. I, I might have that wrong, and. Hopefully I don't get lit up for that, but you know, I mean, it's it, Misha was brilliant. I mean, he was a super good guy. He was like a father to me. I mean, he taught me so many things. Um, I recently visited Cleveland and I stayed with him and his wife, and they made me an awesome dinner. They were they were so welcoming. And then I went off to see some girlfriend I used to have, and I don't feel great about it. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I would see him again in a heartbeat. Just great dude. Was was really good to me. And I remember he said, you know, I've got this uh, grant, and if I don't 
use them and lose them. I've never hired anyone that wasn't a grad student, but you know, you're super bright. I, I want to work with you. And um, yeah, I mean, he really knew how to stroke a guy's ego. And so he's, he's a good <laughs> dude. <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, coming out of Bell Labs, he, you know, if it was just ego stroking, he probably would have uh, saw through that pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, I, I meant more he stroked my ego, but uh, oh, that was like the first validation professionally I'd ever gotten, you okay. know, and so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool, but you're right. I mean, it's probably some merit. To, it's it's like you said, it's that imposter syndrome where you feel like you're the dumbest person in a room because yeah. everyone you're working with is incredibly smart. And so you're not really the dumbest person there. It's just you, you're seeing a level of intelligence around you that you've never experienced before. And, and it's easy to get insecure if you're a thinking person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what it. Don't, I don't want to spend this whole talk talking about Maya because, um, you know, I, I don't really think about Maya that much these days, but... Yeah, I mean, we can do um, this again, right? Like, in the worst case, yeah, there yeah. is no set end time on these, so we can, we can keep going. I yeah, might have another alarm that I'll have to silence, but that's, that's okay. Right, It'll yeah. be like a second. That's all right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's one of the one of the things that I... The, one lesson that I distinctly remember learning at Maya was that... Um, you know, fear is one of the biggest motivators. And I was always afraid that That's brilliant. in the beginning, the few months in off, the by the way, not going to have the alarm to worry about. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Um, I was afraid that like in the first six months or so, I was going to get fired. Like every day I thought, all right, they're going to see right through all my bullshit. Oh, same. I've had that feeling so many times. Yeah. And then, um, you know, like, the stuff that they were giving me to do were like way out of my range at that point of my career. And like fear has just made me do those things. Like I, I successfully did those things. And at the end I was like, Holy shit, I got that done. And it, was <laughs> and it worked. Everybody likes it. Yeah. And I thought, you know, fear is such an awesome motivator. Oh, it really is. I told you before the call when we were kind of just, talking more informally well this isn't really formal but you know what i mean like before we're recording yeah. that i'd mentioned that um i really like you know projects where I, it's challenge it pushes the limits of, of what i can do and it's it's exactly what you said it, it's just like you know it's you know and i try not to take on any project that i don't think i can accomplish ever you know because i don't want to let someone down for real but if it's right on the edge of you know, this is a tremendous challenge that I don't know if anyone's ever tackled before. I mean, I get so excited and it's terrifying because you don't know if it can be done. And, and you try to be honest with your client about that. You're like, look, I mean, this is unknown territory. We're paving new ground here. Um, it's R&D. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, confident that I can do it um, or that our team can do it. It's just, um, you know, we have to go after it and see. And, and when you when you tackle a challenge like that and you're successful and everybody likes it and it works and it's able to get through the edge cases and it withstands the torture from the customer trying to break it, you know, it's such a good feeling. I mean, you're on top of the world. You're Superman for a moment. You know, yeah. it's it's amazing. I, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. There, there are some times where, like, we finished some things up and, you know, it was, like, pretty emotional. Um, there, there are a lot of projects like that where... Um, you know, you get to the end and you almost want to cry. <laughs> well, I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, there was there was one we had last year where I just felt empty inside uh, for like a month after it completed because I, I, I was craving that 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 push, you know, and, and that that, yeah. that challenge and that, you know, just I mean, who doesn't want to get pushed to their, their limits of endurance or, you know, like like and then win. Yeah, correct. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the payoff. Is, is beating the thing that you're not sure if you can beat. I mean, it's, it's kind of the ultimate um, challenge, as it were. I mean, yeah. bodybuilders do it, I guess, by just lifting weights. But I think as engineers, you know, I mean, they're technologists, as you put it, when we talked earlier, um, you know, we, we do it with our brains. You know, you're trying to do something that no one else can do in, in a unique and interesting way that provides value and your client's happy and your team is happy and, when you can do that, I mean, it's, it's like a ballet. It's so beautiful. I mean, it's, it's improvisational. It's, I don't know, I'm getting a little bit, uh, maybe hokey with this, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah, it's a really good feeling when that happens. Yeah. Um, I, I learned a lot from Andy Norman. Um, he was like one of those guys that you just always wanted to be around. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, uh, your your endorsement, by the way, just just inspires even more confidence in someone that yeah, I'm I'm a skeptical dude by nature, right? I mean, you meet this guy, and you're like, is this like is this real? Like, is this person gonna is this gonna blow up? Like, you know, is this sustainable? Like, you know, it seems too good to be true, and you're like, you know, I, I don't know, like I'm I'm skeptical, and I'm, yeah. I'm you know I've just been burned a lot, and so my my nature, and I think a lot of engineers are like this, is to just regard regard everything new with like sort of a skepticism, you know, like a don't quit your day job, like this may not pan out, like, you know, wait and see, you know, kind of a conservatism and not like a political conservatism, but like a, like a risk aversion. And so I don't know. I, uh, I'm glad that you said that because it does, it does kind of make me uh, kind of go in with a little more confidence. I mean, I trust you so much. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. I don't know if that's warranted. I mean, fair enough. Like, I don't know. You, you strike me as somebody that's like not really a BS or like, I don't think you're trying to smuggle anything through. I, I don't know. I could be wrong, but no, I, no, I, you know, I think, I think brute honesty is, you know, one of the easiest ways to maneuver through life. I agree. Um, more and more every day, I might add. You know, it's, it's one of those things yeah. where I've, I've studied all kinds of, like, I've read Machiavelli, I've looked at all that, but it was more to just detect and, and maneuver around jerks as I encountered them in my life. Um, and then, you know, I mean, there, there's a part of you that's enamored by that, and you want to study it and, and understand it and get back. And then you're like, no, this is stupid. It's myopic. You know, if you yeah. burn a bridge and you hurt somebody, you know, then, you know, like, what kind of person are you and, and what kind of relationships are you building? So I think yeah. that's a good way to live. Yeah. Um, and especially about like weaknesses, um, you know, the sooner you're upfront with people about what you are not good at, um, <laughs> it's just awesome because, you know, most times they'll not ask you to do those things that you're bad at. So, yeah. And then if they do, and you say, you know, you remember, I'm telling you, I really suck at this. <laughs> so, um, you know, I can't guarantee what you're going to get. And usually they'll say, okay, that's all right. Try to do the best you can. And oh, that's, you know. that's, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I don't, I prefer to work on a job where I feel like I'm competent, but if you've performed due diligence in that way and you, and you've informed, you know, a client of, of your, your weaknesses and then you still manage to do the job. I mean, that's, that's incredible. You know? And, yeah. I mean, you try your best and you know, you're up front. Um, there's no expectations. Yeah, it's just like a big pressure release. Yeah, I agree, and that's a conclusion I came to later in my career than than I would like. I mean, you know, I think when I first started out, there was this temptation to you know like pretend to be good at everything. I don't do that anymore. It's a stupid way to live. I mean, you set yourself up for failure, and um, yeah, no, I agree. That's that's you know. A, a... Well, we we all know we all know people like that. Yeah. Um, and, and those are the people that, you know, you can't trust when you're working on a project with them. Yeah. You know, well, because you're never going to get the, the, the brass tacks or what's really going on. I mean, you're never going right. to know, you know, what, never gonna know what's when you're business. vulnerable. Exactly. We had an engineer on a project, uh, I want to say three years ago, three or four years ago now. Um, and they were supposed to build a kinematic system for, for a larger application that I can't get into the specifics of. But um, anyway, they, they delivered a software module that rather than performing a kinematic function, which is, uh, for those that don't know, it, it was backing out joint angles of a robot from the robot's position at, at certain points. And so that, that was yeah. the function. And uh, rather than doing that, which is sort of a complicated problem and requires a, a knowledge of advanced mathematics, this person had a PhD, you know, I, I'd worked with them in industry, I won't say where, and um, they... Um, other than delivering the kinematics engine they were supposed to, they delivered essentially a, a rating to degree converter uh, that used a modulus to wrap around 360 degrees, two radians, and um, and that was it. it. It was a strap onto the default firmware. They maybe changed ten lines, and we paid them. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just saying. We paid them twelve and a half grand to do that in advance of the job. It was incredibly stupid from a management perspective. It was one of the stupidest mistakes ever made. But also cheaper than CMU tuition. <laughs> so, 
I, uh, I learned a lot for the money. Uh, there were three lessons I extrapolated from it, and, and I even hesitate to say this on the air, but we can always edit it out. Um, they were um, right, really, really enforceable and direct contracts with ironclad and well-defined scopes. Um, never put a university on your critical path because this guy was a university professor, uh, which, I mean, that sounds a little jaded, but that's how I felt as a result uh, I mean, of it, it's a whole different environment. Yeah, well, I mean, so what it is, I think, is, you know, if somebody at a school is faced with, you know, do you, uh, you know, publish this research paper, you know, if you're in advance your career or do you complete this project for a client, they're always going to advance their career. Do I do well in the final exam and study and, and, you know, continue, you know, at this university or do I do well for a client? I'm, of course, going to do the exam. You're not going to get yeah. priority as, you know, a, a for-profit entity in that environment, I think, ever, yeah. unfortunately, um, unless you know something I don't yet, which is highly possible because I don't know everything and I never will. But you know, that, that was my experience. And then the other lesson I learned was um, never pay anyone in advance because I trusted this person because I had had lunch with them at a company we both worked for before that, you know, I thought they had my back and I, I mistook... Um, sort of the, an alignment in terms of like we got along and you know we're, we're buddies for for a professional integrity and a competence that just wasn't there and as a result i ended up taking on the chin for an additional 40 grand in consequential uh it's yeah it was it was it, so what they said is they kept they kept telling me everything was good you know like you know we did it we're gonna be there they showed me a matlab demo that was using matlab's libraries which is like a research program that academics yeah. are fond of and so, but there's so, it's so easy to let the libraries do the heavy lifting and not write any code. Um, we had used Python uh, per this person's recommendation. And we probably should have used C++, you know, for the application as, as a programming language uh, for those that don't know. Um, and uh, we ended up with um, just very wonky, non-functional. We had to write the entire thing from, I, again, the 40 grand, because I had to pay, you know, six engineers to do this person's job in a sixth of the time that they were allotted originally to do it because I didn't find out to the very end. I didn't sleep yeah. more than four hours a night for like a month um, because I was just trying to fix it. I found out when I was on a trip to visit my parents in New York City. And so I, I, was, I was about at the, at the Holland Tunnel entrance to Dean Manhattan and, and it all sort of, I, I, I just, I, I got it. So basically our engineers have been worrying me for a while that you know, it wasn't what it should be. Nobody wanted to tell me that this person was conning us because I trusted him and liked him. And, and he was a buddy of mine at the time, I thought. And so everybody was saying, hey, you might want to take a look at the code base. And me as sort of a rookie manager then was, you know, like, I, mean, I wasn't that much of a rookie, but I, I didn't know as much as I do now. And I'm sure I'll know more in 10 years than I do at this point in time. I mean, that's just how it goes. And I, um, you know, I was like, I don't really think I should look at the code base. I mean, that's more of a software engineering function. I'm here as, you know, a manager and a hardware engineer. I don't, you know, like I, I just, you know, I'm not really a software guy. And so rather than looking myself like I should have done from day one, which I would do now if it happened again, you know, it's like suck it up, buttercup. Look at the, you know, code base because that's yeah. part of your job too, even though you don't like it. And so I, um, you know, I sort of just pushed it off to other people. Nobody wanted to tell me the truth of what was going on. And, and it just pulled the wool over my eyes and made it so much worse. And then when the Band-Aid finally got ripped off, as I was entering New York City, or not even there yet, I, was, I stayed in New Jersey for a night just to kind of process it and figure out what we're going to do next. I, um, I thought you were going to say you got to the Holland Tunnel and you turned well, around. It, it, was, it was a place called the Holland Hotel that my assistant at the time booked for me. It was the... the sh <laughs> sleaziest little motel it was, it was like like the room i was in smelled like sex that had gone sour because it had, hadn't been refrigerated properly <laughs> and i was remember this in jersey city this was uh you could see the holland tunnel from the hotel like i don't know where it was in terms of city but like you could you could hit the holland tunnel with a rock it was it was literally like off the highway off so the right tunnel. across the, right across the river from exactly uh, from manhattan. manhattan okay yeah so you were in jersey city yeah yeah must have, I'm, I'm not great no. at, at maps, but I believe it. No, no, it will. Yeah, That's <laughs> a <crazy> place. <laughs> I, I dated a girl from that area, that, and she had a T-shirt I loved. It said, "What happens in Jersey stays buried in Jersey." <laughs> yeah, yeah like good mob uh, reference. 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it's pretty such a kooky place. I haven't. I, I would like to hear these stories. Um, yeah. Let me let me finish this one out real quick. So I, I stayed up. I, I barely. I slept two hours that night. I, I slept with a laptop. I think I fell asleep working, and then I woke up and continued the email I was writing. Um, and then you know, I didn't need it to sleep in, but I got a late checkout just so I could stay up and work on the problem a little bit longer. Then I kind of sucked it up, spent some time with my family, and then I just didn't sleep for a month, like more than four hours. So that was that. Was that. Anyway, Jersey City is a kooky place. Sorry, that was kind of a little bit cynical. No, I mean, yeah. we don't have to go into Jersey City. Um, no, 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 no. I, I've been hogging it. I want to. I want to share the, uh, the love a little bit. Yeah. So, um, my sister, my sister moved to Jersey City uh, for like about eight years. Um, she went to school here, graduated CMU, masters. Nice. Went to Jersey City for um, yeah, like eight years, and she she lived in this brownstone third floor walk up. Ah, oh, that's um, slick. On on Mercer Street. And so I used to go there and visit her on weekends. Um, sometimes I drive, sometimes take the train. Um, and it was just like the most bizarre place. Um, really kooky, uh, but fun in a good way. Um, I, I, I used to say this is like the only city where like the dogs shit in the trees. Because <laughs> like, How the fuck did they pull that off? Like, I, I swear, like, you're walking down the street and there's, like, dog shit, like, on the street. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You're walking down I feel the like street. that's a person's doing. <laughs> it's yeah, so funny. I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, we'd be, like, walking, walking to get breakfast. Uh, there's, like, dog shit everywhere. And, and trees, of course. Um, you're walking down the street. And like the businesses that were closed on Sundays, um, you you walk like a whole city block, and the entire facade of all the buildings had like those big roll down steel doors that covered the entire surface of the front of the building. And it'd be like oh, a whole cool. city block. So um, you know, whole block, you couldn't even tell what was underneath them, what the businesses were, because it just covered everything. The, the roll-down steel facade over the front. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the whole block. I've never seen that before. Wait, that's just, so it's just fortified all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. The whole block. All the way down. Do you think there was, like, an event to precipitate that? Like, there was there was a reason why they put all that crap in there? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I remember... I, remember <laughs> I, got, I got a story about Jersey after this. <laughs> Save it. They're, they're, they're all, you know, they're all painted with, you know, tons of graffiti... And like one, I have a picture somewhere. It's, um, do you remember when, uh, th this was back when they first cloned Dolly the sheep? I remember that. Yeah. That was, that was like late nineties, really early, like 2005 ish. I feel like maybe yeah, earlier, sure. maybe like 2002. Yeah. So I'm walking down and I see, you know, the one, the one, uh, storefront, their whole thing was covered with like sheep and <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Here's one, and now there's another, and another. <laughs> and all the sheep. That's but, hilarious. Um, it, it was pretty cool because, like, to me, that tells me that a tagger was was actually thinking about, yeah, you know, Dolly the sheep. Well, probably giggling hysterically while they did it, right? Like, and then there's another, and another, and another. You know, it's like so. It, it's such a funny self-referential. You know, like yeah. not really trying to be funny bit, and there goes the camera again. But it's all good, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it was it was totally nuts. Um, I'll tell you one more story. I'll make this one short. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I'm not I'm not concerned. Yeah. Like I said, there's no set end time on these for a reason. I just think it's fun okay. to kind of chat. So my sister had like this vintage 1980s um, uh, Honda uh, Civic Gold. I love those know. things. It, I mean, it's old. It was, you know, not in nice condition. It's like an Accord for kids. My first car was a silver Honda Accord, by the way. So I, and I love <laughs> this thing so much. So this thing was all beat. You know, it's beat to hell. Uh, she had it for a long time. Um, and, of course, in Jersey City, you know, it gets banged up all the time. Yeah, I believe so, it. So <laughs> she didn't really use it a lot. But um, 
so every every day you have to move your car from where it's parked to the other side of the street for street. That's relief. just like Manhattan. Yeah. So um, it got to be to the point where people kept stealing parts of her car. <laughs> <laughs> like something they needed. Like specifically, yeah. So yeah. Then break in, then take off, like, you know, the rear view mirror. Like, <laughs> then, then steal the battery. Then take the water pump. That's All amazing. Just, that's that's so targeted. That's so specific. That's yeah. like somebody's got a bad pump rather than going to the junkyard and spending like 50 bucks. Yeah. Then steal it out of your car. They know your car's not parked in front of your house. So, uh, no, anyway. <laughs> um, they keep stealing all the parts of her car. So she takes the car to the mechanic each time. And her mechanic said, hey, you know, around here, we, we put these, these chains and these locks on your hood so they can't get your hood open. So they can't steal your stuff. <laughs> so, so she's like, yeah, give me that. So they, I don't know how they do it, but um, now you can't open the hood unless you go to this mechanic and... You know, he unlocks it from like underneath. Wait, so so they install it, but now you're locked in. <laughs> so, you gotta, so it's another well, steal. <laughs> it's I'm, like... I'm sure that he gave her the key, but yeah. you know, it it's no it no longer opens just with the hood release. You you gotta unlock this chain and lock that's wrapped around your engine in the hood. That's so, amazing. Okay. So they finally... I had, um, I had a gas cap lock on my Honda Accord, by the way, because somebody in Bloomfield put sugar in my tank at one point. Yeah. <laughs> they did. Sounds like, yeah, that exactly. sounds like a former lover. That, that's a, it might have been. I mean, I've had enough of them. But, like, sorry, I shouldn't say that on the air, but whatever. And so it might have been. But I, I think it was just because Pittsburgh is so territorial of parking. I think it was, like, somebody where, like, uh, they left a chair to mark a parking spot or something that I probably didn't notice. Like, I don't remember uh, this, but I'm just I'm just speculating, you know, just based. It was yeah, Bloomfield, yeah. so people act like that around there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I'll wrap up this story. So, um, you know, the chain works for a while. No one's really stealing a lot from her car. You know, just external stuff. Um, and then finally, they just decided they want the whole car, so they steal the whole car. Okay. <laughs> With like, the chain and all. Up. Yeah, it's like, you know, whatever. You know, I really don't need a car in Jersey City. It's one less thing I have to do every day. One less thing I have to do. It's a healthy outlook. So so the car gets stolen, never gets recovered. And then like... Oh, we went right to a chop shop. Yeah, I don't know, something. So eventually, um, like a few years later, she gets uh, this court summons for like, you know... Drive by shooting. Unpaid parking <laughs> <tickets>. <laughs> so, you know, she she calls she calls up and she said, "Look, you know, this car had been stolen like three years ago. Here's the case number. Um, you know, I'm not coming she, to court." She CYA. Uh, she she filed the police report and everything, and then yeah, she yeah, still I got mean, the court. Okay, that's that's ridiculous. Yeah. So. But the New Jersey um, traffic court would not take that for an answer. <laughs> you you have to come you have to come and present your case, and you'll have to bring a printout of your case. And she's like, "It's no, not my not case." Yeah. I mean, you know, you have access to this stuff. Just look it up. Here's the case number. Here's the car. It tells you when it was stolen. Um, it didn't happen. She had to take off work, go to court. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, there's, is, there's all kinds of that is so absurd. I mean, Manhattan. I got I got hit with a parking ticket one time. I mean, this is not nearly as insane as that. And I got to stop to say that's hilarious and ridiculous. And I feel bad for your sister, but it's so funny. And I mean, she had such a good attitude about it that yeah, yeah that's, that's a great story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a, a few come to mind. One is I, I was in Manhattan and in, in Brooklyn visiting my brother one time, and I remember. I got hit with a parking ticket and I wasn't even illegally parked and you know it was like it was totally a cash grab it was like 200 bucks for the ticket and I just went to see I went to pick the dude up walked to his apartment and then walked back out in a legal parking spot and um, I saw all these cars on the block got hit except for one and they had an MTA safety vest like Metro Transit Authority on the dash to mark that it was their car 
And uh-huh. so I photoed the guy. He's like, don't take a picture. I'm like, don't worry, I'm not. Because I'm photoing him. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, I, I basically sent in the photos of the guy, of his plates, of all the cars on the block. And and luckily, New York City is, like, nice enough now to, like, give you an online system where you could dispute. I even have to go back in. They're like, yeah, this is obviously we're, you know, we're in the wrong here. Don't worry about it. You know, you're not going to pay anything. And so, it, but it was a total cash. So, like, my brother was telling me there was, like, a story published where there were, like, people on staff for the MTA that were making, like, 200 grand a year that weren't doing anything, you know. And they were just, they were just they were just been mobbed up, you know. And so, they, basically, it was... Yeah. Um, it was, you know, total just corruption, and I mean, it still goes on. So it's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a kooky place. I yeah, I, no, I, I agree. I, I, I love it too. I've been stuck up at gunpoint in Manhattan, and I still love it. I mean, it's it's such a great, <laughs> it's a dangerous city, and, and you have to treat it with respect. But it is such a fun, interesting. Like you'll meet so many people, and and you'll experience so many things. <laughs> yeah, I you know yeah. I find the stereotype of New Yorkers being like angry and you know mean is like so far so far from how it truly is yeah well it's i feel feel like new york is the only place where people just talk to you like a normal human (laughs) yeah well that's the thing right is is new yorkers get a bad rap for that reason you know they're seen as kind of rude or dismissive but colin quinn put it really well he said in the midwest you know you're like hey how are you doing hello in New York, you're wasting someone's time if you do that. And so the polite thing to do by New York standards is, what do you want? You know, like, you're just super blunt to the point. Don't waste this person's time. Let them get in, get out. You know, it's like the only place where there's two lines. There's the line for people that know what they want, the line for people that don't. And if you end up in that line where you don't know what you want, you're there forever. You know? Yeah. And so, like, I don't know. Like, people people will, will tell you to go fuck yourself to your face. But if you ask them for directions, I found they'll give them to you most time. Like, you know, nobody jerks you around or says, go on the block, do a 180, and then, you know, you're in the wrong place. They're like, okay, you want to get to 76th Street, the streets are numbered, go this way. You know, and I, I don't know. I found people are really, I was there for Hurricane Sandy. And so I, um, yeah, yeah. I was stubborn. And so I, I really wanted to see the Book of Mormon on Broadway. I bought tickets. And um, my dad was warning me, you know, his dad's off to do, and he, he said, um, you know, there's going to be a really big storm. And I'm like, I'm not going to miss the book of Broadway for a storm. I bought these tickets months in advance. I bought four tickets. I scalped two, covered the price of the other two tickets. I'm going to the book of Mormon. I'm going to see it for free. It's going to be great. You know, yeah. screw you, dad. You don't know anything. And so I went to New York. I, I stayed with a buddy in Brooklyn and um, in Bushwick. And I remember, um, and this was like when Bushwick was like, hipsters would walk in packs. because It was like still a little bit dangerous. And so mm-hmm. I, I remember, um, you know, it, it was a good vibe. And um, <laughs> I'd say that kind of more fondly than I probably should, but I liked it. And so, like, basically, um, I remember it happened, and it was apparent. We weren't going to see the show. It got canceled right away. It was the only day, like, the Broadway League canceled all the shows. And um, so we just got wasted. We, we, you know, drank a lot of booze, and we went out in the patio, and we just yelled at the hurricane, like, ah, you know, screw you, Sandy, bring it on, you fucking bitch, you know. Like, you know, and, and we just, I don't know, we just had a good time. You know, we made the most of a bad situation. And then the next day we went out and we just looked at the damage and there were awnings ripped off and the subway was flooded and it was, it was a, it was a mess. But what I remember being the redeeming quality and what I, what I really liked and, and kind of warmed my heart is people were running, you know, their dullies off of a car battery with an inverter. Like, I mean, just the resilience of these yeah. people, like, you know, it was like, your business it could have been destroyed. If you were a weaker human, you wouldn't have survived that. But like people were coming together. They were running businesses by candlelight. You know, um, it, nobody was missing a day of work for that. You know, like everybody was yeah. going in the next day. And, and it just, it just made me feel really good about the human race. And, you know, it wasn't, I think what everyone would have take away from the situation, but I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like, you know, you, you get the true human in New York, that you don't get, you know, like if you're in the Midwest, it's like, or if you're in the South, it's like, it's like fake nice. It's yeah, like yeah, for sure. Nice. Um, but in New York, uh, so here's an example. Like if you're at the grocery store and you start talking to another person in front of you or behind you, you know what they're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> 
why is this person talking to me? <laughs> yeah, of course. My dad's like that. I mean, my parents basically live in Manhattan now. And, I mean, they're, they're yeah. exactly, you know, they're just like, you know, like, you know, just like, don't waste my time. You know, like, they'll say it to your face. You know, it's, it's weird. Well, no, so I feel like here, you know, if I'm if I'm at the grocery store here and I'm talking to somebody, in the back of their mind, they're That's thinking, like, reference. is this guy a serial killer? Is this yeah. guy trying to, like, pick me up? Or is, yeah, you know, what, what's the story? Is this guy going to, like, do something crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just feel like... If you're, if you they assume you're going to do something crazy, and then they just act in a protected way, but it's still, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's my experience. I, no, I, I agree. And, I mean, I think it does make you, and this is going to sound a little pretentious because we're, we're sort of, you know, putting New York on a pedestal. But I feel like when I travel internationally, like that, that learning and understanding still applies. Like I remember being in Morocco in Marrakesh in the marketplace. It's a very touristy area. And kids will come up to you and try to hug you. And you're like, no, you're not going to hug me, kid. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. you, know, you walk back a few steps and, and you know, I, you know, I never had any issue. Like people at, at TripAdvisor, it was making me terrified to travel. Like they were like, you know, like my husband got held up at knife point. It was really bad. This happened. That ha I didn't have any of those experiences. I had, I had a really good time. Yeah. You know, people could have been nicer, but I also sort of treated things with a certain amount of, you know, I don't know, for lack of a better term, street smarts, you know, and, yeah, it's because of getting stuck up at gunpoint in Manhattan and, and you know, like experiencing, you know, people trying to con you from a million different angles and you just, you just sort of think <laughs> yeah. it through a little bit. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I like that stuff. Like it's kind of, I shouldn't say that, like maybe it sounds a little unhealthy, but I don't know, like, like a little bit of struggle, like a little bit of, you know, just things not going exactly right, I think is good for you because it makes you a stronger person, if that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, what did they get from you when they when you got held up? Oh, uh, too much. So basically what happened, I'm glad you asked, by the way. So I um, basically what happened is I was going with a buddy uh, to just, you know, it, it was midnight. And we wanted to just like hang out and eat some cannoli in Central Park. And so basically what happened was um, we're walking through the park and we're just looking for like a good spot to just post up. We had some overpriced Manhattan cannoli, like, you know, like 13 bucks a cannoli or something ridiculous. Yeah, and um, we were uh, we were looking for for a spot, and these two guys. We didn't think anything of it. Just these two guys are walking in the other direction, and they walked past us. And then I heard the slide of what appeared to be like a Glock nineteen click, you know, and, and rack. And it's a very distinct sound. It's a semi-automatic pistol. And uh, for those that don't know, and so basically what it was um, was. You know, immediately, you know, the guy was like, you know, don't move, I'll fucking kill you. You know, like, you know, all this stuff, you know, and, and like, just you know, give me your, your wallet and your phone. And I have a lot of pride. Like, I'm, I'm maybe not as much as I used to. And I think that's a good thing. But I mean, at the time, my ego was a little bit out of control. It was, this would have been like six years ago. It was my first international trip I'd just gotten back from. So I was in the UK and I, I just flew back into Newark and I, I was feeling really good about the world. Like my mind was expanded. I, I had just interacted with people from another place and realized that we're all more the same than different. And, and I was feeling really good about, about life in general. And then this guy comes behind me, gets the drop on me, you know, I, I you know, crap my pants figuratively. And I mean, he's pointing a gun in my face and I was staring at the barrel because I was trying to ascertain if it was a real gun or a BB gun from the caliber yeah. of the weapon. And so, I remember just thinking, like, um, you know, this is a real gun. Um, this guy's got me dead to rights. Um, there was a part of me that was thinking, like, I had seen an article on something called Shot Spotter, which is microphone trilateration for gunshots that the NYPD operates. Oh, yeah. And so, in retrospect, he was probably bluffing. He probably didn't want to shoot me because they can locate that stuff really quickly. However, and, and the penalties are super stiff in New York City. However, you don't think that way when there's a gun being pointed. You'd like to think you're going to, you know, be heroic and, you know, like, <laughs> you know, Bruce you Lee your way out of that. Heroic, I'd say, all right, you can have it. That's what I should have done. So that would have been the wise, that would have been the least expensive move, right? Is here's the money from my wallet. Take my cell phone. Like, you don't need my IDs. They're not worth anything to you. You know, like, let me keep my briefcase yeah. and my cannoli. But instead, I froze up because my pride wouldn't let me, you know, give the guy my stuff. And my intelligence or, you know, common sense rather wouldn't let me, you know, confront the guy and, and get shot or stabbed by the other guy that was his partner. 
And so yeah. instead what I did was just the worst thing I could have done. I just stood there like a deer in the headlights. And the one guy held the gun on me and the other guy um, patted me down expertly. I might better than any bouncer has ever done. Like he knew exactly what he was doing. He ran his fingers like with such finesse up my legs. <laughs> and so it sounds like an erotic yeah. novel. And then he grabbed everything in my pockets. Like it was, it was, it was brilliant. The guy was so good at his job. You know, I hate to say it, but it, I mean, he, he knew what he, this wasn't his first rodeo. And yeah, so, sure. you know, he, he grabbed everything out of my pockets. He grabbed my wallet. He grabbed my cell phone. He grabbed my car keys. He grabbed my, uh, my briefcase I was carrying. He left the cannoli in, in the two bags I was had <laughs> either, in either hand. Um, like, didn't touch the bags. Um, but, you know, I, I was probably out like $1,500 just from having to replace my passport and having a key emergency cut. I couldn't fly home anymore. I had a buddy that a flight attendant that flew me to the UK that was offered to cover my flight ticket to Pittsburgh because he got free ones. I, uh, I couldn't yeah. use that because I didn't have an ID. You can't fly without an ID. And so I had to go on um, like the shadiest like bus lane. I remember there was a guy with like, like an Italian sounding New Jersey accent. And he had a last name that was Chinese, which threw me through a loop. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, I'm just like, what was your last name again? He's like, it's a Chinese name, you know, like it's a bad impression, but you know, he's like, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was just not what I expected. It was a, it was yeah. a subversion of expectation, and so, but he was a good guy. He got me on the bus. You know, I didn't have to have an ID. I, um, my friend that had gotten mugged with me was nice enough to lend me like a few hundred dollars to sort of like get me through to my next credit cards and wallet, you know, and. Yeah. You know, basically, um, you know, and, and yeah, it was like it was like a shirt off his back situation because, I mean, he wasn't a rich man and neither was I. And so, you know, he, yeah. he gave me enough money to get me through, you know, like a week and, and basically, um, you know, just over the hump, as it were. Uh, I had to pay 300 bucks to have a new key cut in the parking lot of the Pittsburgh airport after I bust in and rode a city bus to the airport. Um, yeah, dude, it's, and, and even the guy that was cutting the lock said in the parking lot when I told the story, he's like, yeah, I know you're getting mugged twice here. I'm sorry, but you know, that's what my boss is making me charge. And so I couldn't do anything. I had to pay it. Um, actually, if you Google yeah. New York mugger, there's a story where they rejected my friend's flip phone. Um, they, my friend is trans, so they use the old name, which I know you're not supposed to do, but that was the name at the time. So it's in the article. But if you yeah. if you look up Kevin Cook to Mugger, what the fuck is this? Or Mugger to Kevin Cook, what the fuck is it? If you just look up Central Park Mugger, it's the first result. But it got picked up by the New York Post, the, Post, the Gothamist. They took my phone right away because it was a new phone. Yeah. This person's phone um, was it was like a second generation Windows phone. It was it was a real piece of garbage, and so they didn't want it. You know, they're just like, what the fuck is this? And they handed it back. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so we called the cops on that phone the moment they left. Yeah. Um, they showed up and, and the muggers probably took up, you know, they were, they were fast. They were professional. I hate to say it, but you know, they, they'd clearly done it before the cops yeah. on the other hand, <laughs> you know, they kept us in that central park precinct for about five hours and we got mugged at midnight. So we were there until 5am and, and they were interrogating us. They were like, you know, you know, what's really That's going on here? How did you meet each other? You know, they, they asked everything about us, you know, they put us in separate rooms um, and I said, what would be our motivation to lie about this? Why would we possibly make this stuff up? I mean, we got mugged, you know, like they, they took all our stuff and they were like uh, insurance. Like the detective had no idea, you know, they were just like, you know, just wanted to fuck with two guys in the middle of the night. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm not insured for this, you know, like this is, this is a lot of my pocket, sir, you know? And so anyway, we finally get out of there and I just remember, I don't know, just feeling more violated by the police than by the muggers. It was, it was a weird situation. I mean, I, in the future, if it were to happen again, I would just give them all the money I had on me and call it a day. It would be way less expensive. Yeah. What are some of the things, so we start to talk about, like, tell me if this is too much to get into at this hour, but I'm kind of interested. Um, just like, uh, sort of some of the things you have to think about as like a technologist these days, or like, you know, the, the motivation for the job. And you kind of mentioned this with Andy and, and his role at, um, you know, Maya with, you know, just kind of like, why are you doing it? Or the existential question of, of engineering and technology and, and robotics and why we get into it. I, I, I sort of wanted to explore that a bit if you're, if you're so open to it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, in some ways it's really like a love-hate relationship for me these days. Um, you know, coming out of Bossa Nova for like the last eight years, um, 
you know, I was really proud of the work that I did. You know, yeah. I, when I joined there, I was employee number five, number six, somewhere around there. That's awesome. Um, and they they basically had they they had a robot platform. They they were, you know, they said we're going to build commercial robots using a uh, balancing ball technology. That would have been Hollis's technology, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, you know, that was pretty exciting. We were looking for an application and then we stumbled on an application that really didn't fit with the ball balancing. What was the preliminary application for Bossa Nova? I mean, I've heard different variants of this story a few times, but. I mean, they, they just felt, well, this ball balancing thing makes the robot very sociable because it could navigate among people and it could be really thin. thin. Interesting. Um, but you can do that with a lot of different, like an inverted pendulum, like you guys, I think, ended up with. Maybe yeah. not. Uh, but the ball was omnidirectional. So, like, if somebody bumps into it from any any different side... Yeah, you can't bounce it over. Just bounce, bounce away. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the liability factor for the <laughs> product that, that we ended up going with uh, the business application, you know, it just wasn't there. It makes sense. Um, and and you think about that. You don't think about that when you're early in your career, but it comes to, you figure it out pretty quick when you start to face a few problems like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, we, we got this, this business application and we started running after it. Um, so I architected the electrical system for that robot. Um, and Power then, control, both, like everything? Everything. Nice. The whole electrical system was my responsibility. That's awesome. Um, so I architected it at, you know, once we, once we came up with that plan, um, you know, we had to get ready and do demos, so we had to build a robot. So um, prior to that, we, we just strapped like a Nikon D800 on one of our ball balancing robots and, you know, we're doing proof of concepts that way. Like Wizard of Oz yeah. from behind the scenes kind of stuff. Nice. Yeah. So um, I architected everything. I broke everything down into blocks, you know, block diagrams for the whole system. And then I, I love started that system's designing work. all the custom boards that we had to do. Um, we started hiring people. Um, and so I managed that team that designed all the hardware. Nice. And so I was designing that stuff, you know, at the schematic level. That's really cool. Uh, I wasn't doing board layouts. We, we had a team that was, uh, that I was directing to do that. I, I um, kind of work similarly. So I'll, I'll schematic it out usually with pen and paper, and then I'll give it to an engineer and they'll put it into Altium and do a board layout usually. Yeah. So, um, so from like pen to paper of a block diagram to, you know, like 20 units rolling out of the flex assembly line was like March to August. Flex assembly so, line when you say it? Yeah. Yeah, we were using flex. What is flex? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't. Uh, Flextronics. Oh, okay. Uh, they're like, you know, number three uh, CM in the world. Got as it. far as like volume. Um, so, you know, um, you know that was that was uh, you know like a big accomplishment of getting that done. Uh, lots of sacrifices, lots of technical debt to get there um, in that short amount of time. Um, so um, then I I managed that team, um, and you know. It was exciting for a while, but then as the company grew and, you know, things just got, things got bad, the, the culture just really, really soured. You're it's constantly making bad decisions. It, it, you get forced into making a bad decision. You know, they force you to make a decision that you advise against. Wait, but they want you to put your stamp on it is what you're saying. Yeah, it, well, that... Plus, later on, you know, somebody new starts in the company, and then they criticize you for doing that particular thing ah. that you were forced into, and you're like, hey, you know, I didn't want to do this either, but 
you know, it was a necessity, and sometimes it was. Um, yeah, I've been in that position before, and it's it's unfortunate. You like to yeah. think you're above the politics, you know, and you're like, well, I mean, at least in my my position with SKA, I mean, you know, we're kind of hired guns, and so a lot of the time, like, I mean, you know how it is. There's a corporate politics and a hierarchy, and person A is trying to screw over person B because they want person A's job or person B's job rather. Um, yeah. or, or something like that, right? It's it's like yeah. this weird, you know, like Machiavellian kind of game. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I used to think to myself, well, I'm sort of immune from that because I'm an external contractor and that doesn't affect me. And well, you know, that's not necessarily true. And so what can happen is, you know, even though you're working as a firm separately, people will still blame you for shortcomings that, you know. Well, it's easier to blame they'll, they'll you. put you in a trap. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you're a really easy sacrificial lamb. And, and so what it is is, you know, you'll, you'll say, hey, you know, I, I think this is what you should do. I, I would advise this. They'd say, okay, great, but we're doing this instead. And you're like, well, you know, I, I did my due diligence, you know, so. I feel like I've informed you here, you know, and then, you know, you get loud down a path you don't want to go down. And then when things go wrong, as you predicted, they would, then, you know, they're like, yeah, well, you know, you shouldn't have let us down that path. You're like, well, I didn't, you know? So it sounds like you kind of experienced that from the inside. Yeah. I mean, the thing that surprised me is, you know, everyone's familiar with the term technical debt. Yeah. You know, that's a startup. That's, that uh, oh yeah. There, there are times where you accumulate debt, to meet a certain thing. Um, but, you know, like I kept getting burned for it and I'm like, Hey, you know, this, you know, these people have been around the block before they, they have to know that, you know, you take on technical debt when you need to, and you go yeah. back and you fix it later. Um, if you're smart, not everybody does. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, the other thing was I was working ridiculous hours, uh, you know, like 16 hour days, there were some hundred hour weeks. Um, <laughs> and you know, this was going on for, you know, I worked there for eight years. Um, you know, at least six of it was like 16 hour days. Yeah. My first day at there SpaceX, by the way, was a, was a 19 hour day on a Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like welcome aboard. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I mean, you don't mind doing it. I mean, sometimes it's... Oh, fun. for sure. If it's necessary, especially, and you feel like you're accomplishing something and you're you're helping the team out, like you feel good about it. But if it's repetitive and it's, it's a modus, a mode of operation, you know, and you're, you're doing it over and over again, then it, it feels like a little bit abusive at times. It just depends. I mean, it depends how you're getting compensated. It depends on the necessity of the task. It depends on the intentions of the person assigning it. Um, and, and all that stuff, I feel like is kind of a gray area. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I made tons and tons of sacrifices um, along the way. And it, in the end, you know, to me, it just wasn't worth it. And, you know, as a technologist, you know, you kind of know that no matter where you end up, you're going to, you're going to be subjected to the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so that's something, that's something that I didn't expect when I was in college and early in my career. I never, I don't think any of us do. We're all starry eyed and, you know, just let me conquer the world now, you know, kind of guys. And it's, it's the confidence that only naivete can, can inform. I feel like, you know, when you, when you just don't know any better. Yeah. I mean, you know, really it's to the point of like, you know, I never expected to be exploited. Um, you know, if you think, if you think back to the city, um, you know, when our, when our steel mills were humming along, yeah. you know, city of Pittsburgh, yeah. City of Pittsburgh. Um, you know, the owners of these mills, they, they would just keep dropping the salary because they Wait, knew seriously? there was, you know, if somebody quit, there was always somebody to step in and work it. That's like the opposite of conventional wisdom. That's interesting that that was the, the standard operating procedure back then. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know. Um, it's, it's why like last, the end of June last year, I've kind of not really been ready to jump back in yet. 
That makes sense. So I feel like, you know, every time I look at a company, I think, I, I just start thinking, like, this this company is going to exploit me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm trying to, like, get a sense of how they are. And, you know, you're just reading the job description and you, you start seeing the... the There's red flags. Thing. We want self-starters that don't care about pay, you know. This, yeah. that, and the other. Like, you've got to be willing to pull crazy hours when necessary. You're like, all right, well, when necessary, that's fair. It says the young version of me. Um, you know, the older version of me is, well, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem healthy or sustainable. I mean, I'll do it, but, like, you know. it's yeah. My motivation structure changed, I think, when I started my own business versus when I was working for other people. Because yeah. when you're doing it yourself, it's, it's interesting because it's volatile. Like, if we have a bad year, I mean, I... I take a hit i mean it, it's not even you know like i don't make as much i lose money you know it's like straight up like it comes out of my pocket yeah. and I, I have to pay other people before i pay myself i ran our budgets the other day and i remember like i was the last one on the list and it's like you know it's kind of not not a great take home at the end of it when you look at like the you know the amount and i think everybody has this conception of a business owner is like this dragon sitting on a pile of gold you know kind of just mr burns in their hands together and yeah. that's not the reality. The reality is, is you're taking the largest risk. You know, you're, you're putting your neck on the line. You're the first person to get blamed and the last one to get paid, you know. And, I mean, it's, it's great. It's rewarding. It's fulfilling. I mean, you work really hard because, you know, the stakes are so real and you're so attached to the outcomes. But it's not secure. It's not a rational way to live your life. I mean, it's, it's, you yeah. know, it's challenging for sure. I mean, it takes a certain type of crazy to be able to pull it off. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, it makes sense to me, you know, every time I get a, a new like employee contract, it's just like more antagonistic and evil than the last one. <laughs> Have you I, tried I'm pushing fine. back on some of those terms? What's that? Have you tried pushing back on some of those terms? Like, you can know, you can negotiate those. You know, I, I never have, um, I never have, um, but like at this point in my life, I definitely will. I'll help you if you want. Like I'll show me the next yeah. one. I'll sit down with you. No, I, I mean it's it's. I, we'll bleed I right all over that thing. And I see yeah. the stuff that's in there. Um, I have this good friend that that. Or just for the moral me. support, right? I mean, like I I like working in the shop yeah. with another guy around, even if I'm doing all the work, you know, just because. Yeah. I don't know. It helps. Just... Yeah, my one good friend just got this one contract to do some just some contract work with this, this one company. Um, and he, he, he got the contract and he's looking at it. And he's like, I'm not signing this fucking thing. <laughs> and so he, he goes back to these people and he's like, you know, who the hell do you think I am? Like, if you think I'm that stupid to sign this thing, then why are you even hiring me? Because, you know, I think I'm a smart person and a smart person would not, sign this that's hilarious what did they say and, to that like how they react well it turned into like a big argument and it ah. they they altered they altered the document but you know now you know there's this incredible tension already and, yeah you, you know, it, it, the whole thing. it really sets the tone for the the rest of the relationship there was one and i'm not going to say the name of the company either it was it was it was a large company that you've heard of and um, we we're going to do a piece for them where, you know, it was it was a tight timeline. It was aggressive, but it was kind of cool. It was right up my alley. Um, this company had laid off quite a few engineers and I'd managed to recruit, you know, like half a dozen of the engineers they laid off to work on their projects. So they had intimate knowledge of, of the things involved. And, and it was a cohesive team. We got some really good people. We sort of tested them out in pre-execution and we, we got them running. I, I was, I'm pretty confident we could have knocked that thing out of the park better than what ended up happening. But the contract that we gave them ended up getting rewritten by their lawyers in a way that was so, it was just in bad faith. It was, um, they rewrote the definition of um, the company's intellectual property to include any tangible or intangible creation of the human mind. So basically we own everything from now until infinity all over the universe. If it's on Mars, it's ours. You know, it doesn't matter if it, we paid for it or not. It's ours. You know, they, and then they added a liquidated damages clause 
So, you know, if it's late by a day, you know, we owe them money, basically. So they're eroding our margins down to nothing. And then it was also written in a way where they could determine their satisfaction just based on a whim. You know, there was no metric or, you know, and we, yeah. we had written up a scope and everything. But, you know, they, they kind of wrote that out in a way where they could sort of at will, you know, just, you know, just be like, we don't like it, you know. And then we had to pay them money as a result of that. You know, we would have had to if we had, you know, not read that 80-page document and pushed back on it. And then yeah. it was 60 when we signed it, and they added 20 pages. Um, and then basically, um, in addition to that, there was there was an indemnity clause, and, and those things are, are deceptively bad. Um, so my mom's a corporate litigator. Um, like She has been since the 70s. And um, basically, I mean, this is why we're able to hold our own as a small company in that negotiation. And my mom and I stayed up in shifts and, and worked our end of the contract. You know, We didn't pay a dime for legal. And we just, uh, the opposing firm is, is a big one. I won't say which one, but it, it was, you've heard of it. And so you've probably yeah. worked with them. And so uh, basically <laughs> we estimated that the prospect spent $20,000 on, on their end of this negotiation. We clocked 160 hours. And so um, yeah. it, it was fun. Actually, it bonded me and my mom like closer than I'd ever been to her in my childhood. Like it was one of the most intimate things we've ever done together. And um, yeah. my grandmother had just passed. And so it was kind of like, I was close to my grandma and my own mom. And after my grandmother passed and her and I put in these shifts, I think both of us developed a respect for the other one that we'd never really had. And so, yeah, yeah. I mean, she saw what I did and I saw what she did, you know, and we're like, okay, this, this person's all right. <laughs> like, yeah, and, so, yeah. and so it was pretty cool. And so that was the silver lining. But I remember um, like she still is SK's general counselor. Um, and so... You know, we, we kind of, we, we got really close over this and um, it, it was just in such bad faith. I mean, you know, the, so the indemnity thing I started talking about. So basically that's, that's deceptively bad. And so it doesn't seem like much. It's like, you know, you shall indemnify and hold harmless the other party. You know, what's the harm in that? Well, there's an adage that my mother told me and, and the adage is this. So she was hired to represent a, uh, a large corporation in Manhattan. Um, I believe, and they had an Italian contract manufacturer, and the CM was responsible for building these picnic tables for kids, and basically the picnic table had an engineering, not a manufacturing defect, but an engineering defect, it had nothing to do with the manufacturer, but the manufacturer had signed an indemnity clause, and so the defect was such that when collapsed, the picnic table would amputate children's pinkies, <laughs> and uh, it was bad. And, and so when the lawsuit started rolling in, eventually became a class action. My mom's job was to call up the Italian company that indemnified the New York company and say, hey, guys, um, this is now your lawsuit. You deal with it. Click. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, I, I was advised against signing that contract on the grounds of those three clauses. And I just stripped. I said, these are our sticking points. And I. I know it sours the grapes or whatever, and you don't want to work with a company that pulls that kind of stuff. But at that point in my career, and I think even to some extent today, I enjoy a challenge or sort of a difficult, even negotiating problem. And so I, you know, I thought to myself, like, I can salvage this. If I just stick to my guns and I stay rational and level-headed and I, I pitch on the value of the team and the service we can provide and, you know, our collective portfolios, you know, we, we can win this. And, and, you know, even though, you know, there seems to be a lack of trust now, we can earn it and, and we can we can do okay. Well, that didn't work out that way. The, the trust was eroded. Uh, there was eventually an ultimatum issue. You know, it's been too long. We have to leave this. And I'm like, great, you know, go away, please. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know that, that was the end of it. And um, yeah, to date, I mean, you know, not, I had no regrets. I feel like we dodged a bullet on that one. And, you know, it, yeah, it really wasn't going to happen in, you know, in a positive way. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, I don't know, bringing it back around, <clears throat> that's kind of what I feel like, you know, as, as a technologist, you know, you love, um, you love your disciplines. You know, for me, um, you know, I'm still amazed at the physics of electricity <laughs> you know, but I mean, to me, it's, it's still magic. Oh, for sure. Uh, um, you know, I could take electricity and I could make it pass through 
a bunch of conductors and semiconductive materials and it's going to do something amazing like an autonomous robot or you know whatever yeah it's so um, beautiful yeah i mean it it's to me it, it it's still magic yeah um and that excites me but on the other hand you know the the act of working um in a lot of ways a lot of a lot of my late experiences have been you know very um you know i just felt very exploited yeah um no you know, i don't know if i should say this during a podcast but it's all good you know when i when i left bossa nova um you know it's employee number five or number six i don't know i'm not sure which no worries. um i've been there for eight years i had an immense scope of work there um tons of accomplishments um and then they said well you know we're we're running low on cash we gotta let you go um you know there's no severance cash sorry i'm like that's, you know, that's rough you build this company yeah from the ground up like like in yeah at the ground I mean, literally level. i yeah. helped them build the company yeah um there was only one person that had been there longer and it was the founder wow everyone so, else left like employees four or five if there yeah, was a five gone. yeah they were two or three they had all moved on um wow no one no one was in the company as, as long as me other than the founder that's insane uh, and you know they're saying well you know we, we just can't do it and i'm like i'm sure if you go to the investors you could get this approved um, but um, they definitely uh, lost sleep over it too for what it's worth I mean I, I have to believe that like you know, it doesn't make it better I mean but you know like I'm sure they didn't make that decision in any way lightly I mean maybe I'm naive here I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they all slept really fine I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's I'm, fucked up I believe you, know, you by the way what's that I said I believe you but but that is unfortunate. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think they really cared. They're like, uh, you know, hey, you know, send me a resume. We can help you find another job. They said that. Yeah. No thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jesus. I mean, we talked about Kristen yeah. earlier, and um, I mean, I don't know if you knew or not, like what her job exactly entailed at, at Deep Local, but I mean, she was the operations director. I mean, and, and I mean, as you probably know, like the chief operating officer or the operations chief or the operations director or the, um, I don't know, the commanding officer, you know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that's the person that does all the work, fires yeah. people, you know, constantly for, for the CEO. They're the bad cop and the good cop, bad cop situation. I mean, it's a difficult job and it wears on people. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to say anything about Chris in particular, but. I know the people that hold that rank in general, like, I mean, a lot of times, like, like their life isn't that easy. Like it's psychologically really draining. Anthony Bourdain's a good example where, you know, it's like, I mean, he, he was hired to be effectively a hatchet man, you know, to, to fire people for this restaurant, you know, he, he's got this bit in a book, Kitchen Confidential that I, I really adore. I mean, I've never watched his TV. I probably should because I, I really love him as an author. And, um, but he's got this bit where he had to tell, like, you know, the, it, you know, he's talking to the, the Hispanic line cooks in the restaurant. He's like, no mas trabejo, like no more work, you know? And it's like, but why, you know, like what's going on, you know? And it's like, sorry, you gotta go. You know? It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's like, it's, I don't know. It's not easy for the other person unless you're a sociopath, like certain yeah. politicians I could think of that I don't want to talk about in the podcast either. But like, you know, it's just like. I don't know. I don't think most humans get off on firing a person. Like, I think that's, no, you're a special kind of, so yeah. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, when you, when you're working for a place and you think about the compensation, they say, Oh, we're giving you all these stock options and you know, we can't afford to pay you your full salary. So we'll give you, you know, 20% of your pay as stock. Like, yeah, that's just fine. But, um, you know, 
So I've amassed a lot of stock in stock options. Did you get to retain the stock options at least? No, I mean the company. The company is now defunct. I'm Fuck. glad I didn't buy my options because you know it was only a couple months later. I mean they're not officially closed, but um, you know really there's only a few people that remain, and they're basically just mopping up. Yeah, I've seen that at other firms around town. That's that's really unfortunate. Somebody asked me how I was doing recently. Um, not re- this was like a couple of years ago, and um, is the head of sales at another big robotics company that you've heard of for sure. And um, you know, I said, well, just fine if you like building relationships um, from the ground up with startups, and then watching them run out of money, and then doing it all over again like Sisyphus. You know, which I don't know if you follow yeah. Greek tragedy, but it's the guy that you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, I don't know, that, that made him laugh. <laughs> you know, and so it was, it was a good yeah. icebreaker. But, uh, yeah. I like startups, but. I do too. Um, I mean, I, I'm an entrepreneur myself, obviously. And I, yeah. I have a soft spot for them, and I always will. I mean, you get to, you get to show big gains. You get to start with nothing and go to something big. Um, if you're lucky. And, and talented. You know, there's always the ups and downs where you're not getting paid for you know, a couple of months or whatever, um, that happens, you know, that's just fine. Um, but you know, the whole stock option thing is just, it's just a scam. Yeah. And, you know, so tying this all back, you know, as a technologist, um, you know, there's, there's just a lot. And I guess there is with every job. I mean, you just think about Fauci, all the, all the shit that Fauci went through over this past year. Oh yeah. Well, I actually haven't been following the news that closely. I mean, this, this probably also isn't a good thing to say on a podcast, but what is, what has he gone through? Like just to, to inform my unenlightened ass here. Well, I mean, if you think of Fauci, you know, I'm sure Fauci really loves his field and he loves what he does, but you know, for the past year, he, you know, he's been silenced by the white house. (laughs) He's been ridiculed by the president. Um, he gets death threats. He wait seriously? To, yeah, I mean he had, he had to get a twenty four seven security detail. Wait, actually, for a fucking doctor? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I feel like he always struck me, and I haven't followed him that closely. I've just watched like one or two interviews, and, and the impression I always got was that the interviewers were kind of kissing his butt, but then that he just wanted to do his job and he was kind of like a, you know, a non-biased straight shooting guy. And he just wanted to, he just wanted to be a doctor and not, you know, deal with any of the politics or that nonsense, but he was kind of forced into it was the feeling I got from, from the interviews. I don't know if that's correct or not, but I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I don't claim to know, but I, my impression of him is that, you know, he understands everything very deeply from a science perspective and his job is to help this virus, um, you know, be as small of a problem as it can possibly be through his help and his guidance. Yeah. And, you know, he's been censored, he's been ridiculed, he's threatened. Um, so, you know, going, going back, you know, technologists, there's a lot of things that you have to deal with these days. Um, uh, you know, you're not going to work a 10 hour day. Uh, you're not, don't even think about an eight hour day. (laughs) if, if If you work at a good place, you might be able to get away with like a 14 hour days. Yep. 14 hour day. Um, Wait, but first when you said you're not going to work at 10, I thought you meant under that. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> like you're going to work at six? You meant, I, I get it now. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, the, I don't care where you work. You're not going to work any less than 10 hour days. Yep. Um, if you're in any position that matters for sure. Yeah. You, you're going to be working at least 14 hour days. Um, and, you know, in employee contracts are getting increasingly, increasingly aggressive. Um, you can push back. <laughs> and you're, you're just, you're going to be exploited. Yeah. 
if you allow yourself. And there's ways around that. I have to believe yeah, that in my heart of hearts. Really, it's really hard. You know, it's just like the same thing. Yeah, you could you could try to work twelve hours in or ten hours and get by, but you're not going to get anywhere. You'll probably end up getting relegated to some stupid projects that nobody <laughs> wants to work on. Um, you do want the person that's willing to take a bullet for the project. I mean, I, I hate to say it, like, and, and it doesn't feel right, but I mean, if you're going to put your reputation and your company on the line, like, I don't know, like, you know, if, if you know somebody's willing to, to break their back to get it done, like, I don't know. I mean, my approach as a manager has been, I mean, you definitely want those people that are willing to be exploited, but then you want to reward them like as much as you can. And I mean, I've taken a loss just to pay people, you know, more than me on projects where they contributed a significant chunk. I don't know. I mean, that sounds kind of maybe a little altruistic or naive, but does that make sense? Like, am I, am I kind of yeah, talking yeah, on that? Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. I, I, it, the only thing I would say is it just seems like you should be able to, you know, rewrite your contract and, you know, not work crazy hours. You can. And, you know, do all of these things. But in practice, I just feel like you you won't get anywhere if you if you do those things. That's so I've 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 actually walked away from, from more negotiations than I've than I've, you know, signed because of that mentality. I mean, which is like, I'm not going to sign a bad contract. I'm sorry, I can't do it. And so I, I've, I've attempted to negotiate every single bad contract. I've never walked away from one because the tone didn't feel right. I've always said, you know, let's, let's keep going. But there's a lot of them where like I've pushed hard enough that the other parties walked away because I am furiously willing to cut off my nose to spite my face on, on those negotiations. Yeah. You know, to be a technologist now, I think is really exciting. Things are moving so quickly. Um, you know, you and I have talked before. You know, when I was when I was in college, um, you know, most people hadn't heard of the internet. I hadn't. I didn't hear about it until. Uh, Would this have been the early nineties? What's that? Would this have been the early nineties? Just to try to put a date. Yeah, it's the early nineties. Um, so. Um, I would have been you know, two I, years old at the time, but I study history. So. Yeah. so it was like 1992. I read an article about this Four years old. new thing, <laughs> the internet. Nice. And I was like, oh man, this is, this is totally cool. Yeah. Um, how could I hook up to this thing? And yeah. so I found out there was, a, there's a couple of guys in Pittsburgh that had set up an internet provider. They had 10 phone lines. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, the, the company was called Telerama. Telerama. Nice. So like Futurama, but Telerama. Yeah. Awesome. Telerama. Um, so I signed up. I got an email address. I had a dial-up modem, which I think was like 1,200 baud. Um, and um, so back then... Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit before, you know, if, if you're designing a circuit, um, and you want to know what ICs are going to use, you go to paper catalogs that hopefully <laughs> you, you've asked for from, you know, Fairchild, TI, analog devices, um, National Semiconductor. G. Yeah, and you have all these on your shelf, so that like if you if you need to design a circuit, you go to the data books. Like I need an op band, so you know I'll go to National Semiconductor. Back in the days um, when, well, we still use op amps, I guess, for comparators and like amplifiers yeah. and stuff. Well, that's what it is, an amp. But, yeah, uh, filters and amps. Um, so you know you had to do that in a book on your shelf, but now. I, I just can't. I just can't imagine having to go back. Well, dude, the fact that you can go to DigiKey or Mauser and just look it up, and you know, or like you can, you can be, you can have a board torn down, and you can just, you know, like I think it, you know, this is the model number, and you type it in, you know, and you know, you just you're up, you're at the races, you know, you're ready to go, you've got the specs right in front of you. I mean, it's it's so instantaneous you, you could, now. You could pair them up parametrically search for, you know, an op amp and distill 
you know, 10,000 different parts down yep. to a handful. Yep. And they all do it now too. Like every manufacturer has got that search engine to compete with each other. Yeah. Or not manufacturer, sorry, uh, vendor has that search engine. Yeah. And then by the way, you know, you could download the data sheet. Um, you could download the footprint. You could, yep. you know, but the footprint's a number, but then you look up that number on Google and you've got the exact dimensions and, you know, CAD models are easy and so. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, that, that makes life, it, it makes progress much, much faster. And I think technology today is moving much faster. Um, and I don't know. It, it's almost like, um, you know, there's so much, there's so much out there that you just don't know what to do anymore. Um, you know, I think, it's, it's I mean, like having a milling machine sitting in your basement. Um, you know, there's so many possibilities that there's just too many and you, I don't know. That. I feel like when you've got, you know, like a hundred, not identical, but seemingly identical parts where you mentioned the parametric search. So you, you search, you type in your parameters, you search for your component that meets the specifications you need. And then oftentimes I'll just pick, you know, like the least expensive one that fits spec or, you know, I mean, like if there's, you know, some other variables, you try to look at the different options, but if they all, if they all are up to spec and they all meet your requirements, I mean, they all meet your requirements so you can move forward. Right. Like, or, or am I wrong yeah. on that? Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, I want to be corrected if I'm wrong. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks. Yeah, but um, you know, there's so many, there's so many things that you could do with these the switch days. To run, but, uh, um, you know, solar is going nuts. Energy, there's lots to do. Cars, transportation. Um, uh, there's, there's just so many ways to go, and you know, figuring out what you want to do is. Um, is almost difficult. Well, so it's easy. About all, all the robotic applications. I mean, a, a good word for it, I think, is is analysis paralysis. So it's, I mean, you know what it is, yeah. but I'm going to say it anyway for the viewer. It's it's when you're when you're looking at if you're still with us when you're looking down the path of that problem, where you know you've got a hundred different options and it's almost blinding because you don't know which direction to choose. You know, and it's Richard Feynman described it, and surely you're like Mr. Feynman if you remember that book. Yes, yeah. there's a mule with two piles of hay, but when you move toward one, the other one gets bigger. You start to move toward that one, and then that one gets bigger. And he was yeah. describing competing offers from two universities for a salary, but you know, and he eventually just picked one. I think it was Cornell on one with it. But um, you know, I mean, I feel like it can be that way. And I mean, at a certain point, you just have to pick a lane. And 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 you know, there's um, there's a famous salesperson uh, named Zig Ziglar that, that I'm a big fan of. And um, he has this book, like it's like, it's like the secrets of closing the sale or something, but it, it's really analytical. And he goes into like all this experience and, and different techniques you can use and he distills it down to tactics and then he names them. And so like one that I really like is called the puppy dog close and it derives from pet shops where, you know, somebody's on the fence about buying a puppy. And so, the sales technique uh, that's classically trained that, that this guy goes into is you say, well, why don't you take it home for a week? And if you don't want it, just bring it back. Nobody brings back a puppy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And so that's the puppy dog clothes, you know, so I just try it out for a little bit, you know? And, and so, um, you know, and it, 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 I like it cause it's non-committal. You're not, you know, dismissing somewhere, forcing them down an alley. You're just saying, you know, check it out. And if you like it, you know, like go with yeah. it. And if you don't, you know, don't you know and so the way that i've distilled that for our work is you know i, I say look bring us in for this job time and materials and if we're not doing a good job fire us please because you're not doing either of us any favors if you keep us around and we're not you know we're not helping yeah. you i mean i, I don't want to be in that position and i know you don't want to be in that position so let's just do that you know and, and oftentimes that seems to be an effective tactic and yeah. it, I don't feel like it's dishonest or, or in any way misleading. I feel like you're just, it, it's almost like that New York thing you were talking about where you know, you're just like, look, like, let's just try this out. And if it doesn't work, let's not do it anymore. You know? Yeah. 